So what I want to share here is actually quite a few works uh, that happened in the last five you know, years in my group, try to interpret deep uh, neural networks in the context of scientific machine learning, but also in general and towards trustworthiness. So we're kind of in the age of AI, and I really like this quote from Bill Gates, AI is like nuclear energy, both promising and dangerous. And data science is really an important piece of um, AI. It's like the core or the um, cornerstone and has this computer science, math and stats and domain knowledge and machine learning sits in the middle of computer science institutes it's really driving um, many of the development in AI and data science. So the view I take on data science, it's really a whole system. It's a whole cycle with many, many steps and we have to look at them in an you know, integrated way. And the important part of this data science ecosystem is actually people. Here I have my team a couple of years ago and all my collaborators, cardiologists, and cosmologists and cell biologists. So all of us work together. And one important thing to communicate to this scientific uh, collaborators really interpret and really explain in a transparent way all the judgment calls we make, right? Anybody who has done data analysis know that we make lots and lots of judgment calls. And more and more with the development of very good software, we have to pay attention to critical thinking and really um, vet all our judgment calls, at least make them transparent and think data science as like almost like uh, assembly line as we used to call institutional quality control and we need quality control. So to interpret for my um, scientist collaborators and also to the public, right? EU has this um, general data protection regulation and need, the algorithm needs to be human interpretable. Oops. Um, here are just some examples uh, why interpretation is needed, right? FDA wants to know why a deep learning works for radiology and somebody has a startup. And the first, last, the middle two are the things I'm uh, working with. We want to understand how different genes drive a particular phenotype, say a heart disease. And also cosmologists find deep learning very useful for estimating um, some parameter about the origin of the universe and they want to know why it works. And in general, uh, like sentiment analysis, more generic machine learning problems. The second part of my talk is really on um, scientific machine learning, which um, in cosmology and cell biology. And scientific machine learning in particular needs interpretation and also at a higher standard. So I define scientific machine learning as the field of machine learning and science, whatever the domain science you work on, working on, that brings scientific knowledge to the modeling stage and also the modeling really builds new scientific principles. So it's kind of this interaction. And the results have to subject to scientific standards. And I will say the theory of scientific machine learning have to be relevant to uh, the scientific practice. And we need open source and reproducible software as well. And we start working, try to define interpret machine learning a couple of years ago. And we have many of my people work on different aspects, scientific, I mean, machine learning in general and scientific machine learning. And we put our forces together, our mind together, try to define things so that we know when we talk about interpret machine learning. So I have this paper two years ago called Definitions, Methods, and Application Interpret Machine Learning. And we really propose this, which is called PDR um, kind of framework, P for predict the accuracy for reality check. D for descriptive accuracy has a lot to do with the domain problem and domain interpretation. And then we really emphasize this relevancy. We cannot really talk about interpretation unless we know the audience. We try to interpret the machine learning algorithm or statistics too, and for whatever uh, the problem we're working on. So you can have the same audience depending on the problem, then you might want to choose different interpretation. So really bringing the domain problem and human into the loop of interpret machine learning. And usually people think that decision trees probably more small decision trees. I mean, huge decision, I don't think it's interpretable. Small interpret, uh, decision trees are interpretable and emulatable in the sense that humans, doctor can really follow. We we'll work with ER doctors, UCSF to kind of uh, use PCS, a framework I'll introduce later to really uh, replicate some of the decision rules for uh, diagnosing uh, kids' uh, abdominal um, trauma. And human can really know how the algorithm worked, right? This, and then you go to logistic regression. Small logistic regression, we also think it's interpretable, but 
it's not like we can do most of us do summations and the modification of 10 terms very fast. So I don't feel it's, it's as interpretable. And then you have random forest to sim, I mean, because decision trees, and then you have deep learning. So roughly this is um, what we roughly, I think, agree. And then I'm gonna take later the deep learning and make an interpretable actually come back to something in physical science is very interpretable. I hear for the previous talk already mentioned wavelets have to do to adaptive wavelets. So there's a whole nice interaction from complex models use the computation power of search and then come back to something for domain area very interpretable. And most of the interpretation work is actually after you feed the model, suppose it's a good model, and then you look at the results. You can look at globally, and you can look at feature importance, significance, visualization. We can look at different cases and see what particular, um, say, a patient, why the, the diagnosis was made. But this is usually after the model is made. And I'm going to try to bring the trustworthiness to the whole process. Because if you don't have the process trustworthy, I don't think you really want to interpret the model. And as I said earlier, that um, relevance is the key for scientific machine learning. and the insights you get out have to correspond to facts and to correspond to established factual information. Where do we get the trust, right? We talk to the best scientists, the best doctors, and we get some qualitative verification, kind of randomized try to try something out, knock out experiments. So that's kind of in the scientific domain. But we also need to look at how we do data science and machine learning. It's really what I said, this data science life cycle, and we need to vet every step of the way. And we propose this framework called predictability, computability, and stability, which I'll uh, get to. So for the rest of the talk, I'm kind of uh, covering our work in the chronological way. We start interpret deep learning models in more general sentiment analysis, just computer vision problems. And then we start working with cosmologists and went into science. And then because of the scientific collaboration, Babelet just for local field transform, we end up doing adaptive wave distillation and we have new kind of external study in cell biology and the method just kind of borrowed over and transferred and worked really well. And I'll end with our framework for building trustworthy and uh, responsible models. So this um, ACD, what we call agglomerate contextual decomposition was attempt to build down all this feature wise importance like pixel wise to the next level for future interactions and then how we visualize in a more understandable way. The interpretation work in the field of deep learning kind of fall into two categories. So have something to do with perturbation. One is local perturbation gradient based, the other is occlusion in room certain parts and either through the model or in the images. So what we propose fall into the occlusion and really look at the interactions of features. So this is our STM model for sentiment analysis. And you want to combination why the sentence is positive. So people can say what's the importance for not good and good. We want something also give some importance for not good. So uh, this is um, the time to give build compositionality into the importance. So this is an Aquilar paper about three years ago, uh, Jamie Mordock and um, Dr. Liu from Google. We uh, worked together to really do this generalization to feature interaction by really looking, opened up the deep learning, this particular LSTM, and then really trace how the different, like the features you care about really get propagated into the network. So it's quite mathematical. I won't give the detail, but uh, heuristically, it's really try to take the original input, decompose into the relevant part and the non-relevant part, very good, that's what we care, and the non-relevant part, and let them pass through. This is already a given model. So we're not fitting model here. And then trace all these different parts get propagated. And then we force some additivity and make them into two parts and give a score for relevant and non-relevant. And we later generalize to um, images in a similar way. In the first paper was only for uh, ISTM. So, and then we want to, in this paper, generalize to uh, CNNs. And those who want a way to really 
organize our interpretations, not just, oh, there's here the scores and you go figure. So there was, we really tried to follow our, our PDR interpret machine learning framework. You know, we already have a good model. We have predictive accuracy covered. And then we look into how do we present, this is a general audience thing. We're not really for a particular uh, scientific um, problem uh, in a way that a general audience can understand how these different important scores come together and relevant to general public who care about machine learning and uh, machine learning developer. So this is a, a kind of general uh, development. So now we can, with our new scores, we have scores, kind of hierarchical clustering. And we use the drop of the scores or the increase of scores of the feature very good to decide which to, to combine to have the biggest importance um, increase. And then we just make it hierarchical. So it's, it's hard modeling by using our scores because we have uh, scores for also features, not just not very good, but also very good and not very good. And this is a more a complex sentiment analysis. And from here, you can see that um, the negative is the red and the, the CD score for the sentence then it's positive. And you can trace where things got a bit negative and become positive. And you really see oh, how this um, um, prediction from this um, basic elements of words become a label for the whole sentence. You can do the same thing for um, an image, right? You can, this is just many, many steps because if you start from pixel, it takes a while. So we're skipping, we're not showing you the whole progression of merging in a hierarchical way. And you can see that um, even you don't have a puck in the um, image, you know, you're still gonna label it as uh, having a puck because you have skates. So this is give you a sense where the algorithm pay attention to. And we did two human, small human experiments. The first one, you have a text and image, MNES and image net, so three data sets. And the first experiment was have the subjects in about 11 graduate students that whether they can use these different interpretations to tell whether the prediction is good now. So how do we create bad predictions? We randomize certain weights in the um, deep learning, still keep the same label, but make the weights not very relevant. And then that's a bad, and then there's a good one just from original uh, prediction from a deep learning model. And we have different measures, two from us, ACD and CD, the two darker ones, and the uh, integrate uh, gradient and occlusion. And so the first experiment you can see that we for especially for image net, we did quite a bit as well. So they get, you know, 70%. Um, oh. And for the second experiment, we're looking at trustworthiness. So look at the expect, like the interpretation from these four different methods. Would you trust the method? And you can see that we also came ahead. I mean, for MNIST, it's an easy one. A lot of methods, we, we're a little worse than actually IG, but uh, it's a very local image. And, and But overall, we did really well. MNIST is everybody did pretty well, but not for the trust. You can, occlusion didn't do as well. So this gives us some confidence that it's not just we made it up some mathematical decomposition, but instead that humans agree because interpretation is very much aimed at humans. So we want some indication humans actually agree that uh, our interpretation is helpful or useful. And then we had an uh, ICML paper last year um, with Laura who was visiting from Denmark and Chandon and Jamie and then still with me, Jamie graduated, and to really bring back our interpretation to de-emphasize certain things. So certain pixels you don't want it to, your algorithm to pay attention to, you can put a penalty on that. We put an L1 penalty and then use the score from our algorithm. And so that the revised algorithm will pay less attention to certain parts. So you don't want the image to pay, say the boundaries of your image, you cut it in a circular fashion that has no information. So you can really, channel back your understanding interpretation and revise the algorithm. Then we start working with um, uh, Francois um, Lanus, who now back to uh, Paris and his colleagues. And my postdoc Wusuk and Chandon, my great student, are leading effort working very closely with Lanus. So 
I always want to do scientific machine learning. So I said, it's great. We do this generic interpretation. I want to see how it works in science. So the problem we're working with um, Francois and colleagues on was to estimate using simulation. So this is simulations. So there's a very important uh, cosmo cosmological parameter called omega m, which is really the fraction of play um, in the beginning of Big Bang that's covered with mass. And they can do PD simulation forward and get a map of mass in the universe, which is you can also get from something called weak gravitational lensing um, measurement, and then you can process and get a massive mass in the universe. So this is simulation. We can directly get a massive mass in the universe. So that's the purple image is the data. And um, Francois and, and, and his colleagues already built um, uh, ResNet, I think 18 worked really well to estimate uh, omega m. Why? We know because it's simulation, we know what's omega m. But can we identify important things? But then they say, you know, remember the relevance. The pixel space is not very interpretable or not very important for physics. It's really the frequency domain. So we need to really interpret things in the frequency domain. And as I said, the relevance comes in and we have to go to frequency domain. So we have to generalize our interpretation. Actually, many methods can be generalized through a, here's the inverse transformation and just put the inversion and the original deep learning F into F prime and then use our, um, our interpretation for F prime. And we interpret that. So it can be done by uh, our method and other methods. So what we have is the frequency domain. You see that that's the frequency domain images with 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. And then we can calculate the CD score in this because we can do feature interaction, right? Not just pixel. So the whole transform became just a big feature, very interacting, and we can get the score. So the CD score, you can see peak at around 0.3. This is actually um, well supported by physics, saying that's the very important frequency for estimating omega m and the other frequencies, especially high frequency, are not as important. So this will help them maybe reduce simulation at higher frequencies so that they can get um, moving to really answer genesis omega m. <clears throat> and then independently, I worked on wavelengths many years ago for uh, <clears throat> signal processing. And, you know, Fourier wavelengths is uh, <clears throat> local Fourier transform. And we also heard in the past talk, last talk that <clears throat> wavelengths have sparsity and it's really nice convenient. And Francois actually also suggests to my students that we should look at wavelengths. I didn't <coughs> know that actually they also, cosmologists already <coughs> used wavelength domain um, to, to estimate omega m. So this is just a very tall example to show that CD for this simple example of just a thresholding behavior, we really get. Um, to the right threshold and uh, the other relative um, other measure don't do as well. So this brings us to the uh, second part of the talk, a depth of wavelength distillation from neural networks to interpretation. So we started with Francois and then we just borrowed the measure for another collaboration was going with uh, Gauco from uh, Advanced Imaging Center by Image Center at the Berkeley and we use on cell biology problem. So this is really external validation and transfer learning you can see for the method, still led by Wish, uh, Wusuk and Chandon. So model distillation uh, started around 2015. How can we, in the beginning was, how can we take a complex deep learning model and make it into a simpler model? And later people generalize to decision trees or attitude models. So it's really whatever the interval model is as is relevant to your field, you should try to see whether you can distill from a complex deep learning, which has a lot of advantage of searching in a huge space, but in pretty um, data-driven way. So we said, because the, the physics, we want to do local field transform and wavelengths very interpretable, can we distill into a simple learned wavelength transform? We want to improve interpretability, compression, and efficiency. So this is a one slide intro to wavelets, right? For people who seems the younger generation um, not as aware of wavelets as the older generation. 
beyond my, uh, apply mass. <clears throat> so time series is just tiling the time and frequency domain only according to time. And the Fourier transform is only tiling the space according to frequency. And with this strategic tiling both, right? You have to see you have bigger uh, um, bin for the frequency because you think high frequency probably the most useful signals uh, uh, is not as important. So this is just huge. Um, <clears throat> A few decades ago was a huge uh, area and really beautiful, elegant math and with a lot of signal processing, um, like applications and uh, good books. And wavelets also come out from neuroscience, you know, deep learning, we think have connections to um, really bring functionality. And you can construct these global wavelets mathematically through derivatives, Gaussian density function. Um, First layer of Alecnet also look like Gabor, if you ignore the color. And early on, addiction learning, the work by Alhausen and uh, David also showed that, uh, field also showed that um, you can also get it from unsupervised learning. And there's also sign of physiology work, Hubble and Wiesel to show we one cells are act like uh, Gabor. Oh, um, edge detectors and location. and and this location selectivity, frequency selectivity, and also um, um, orientation selectivity. So here's what we decided to do, right? We really want to start with a deep learning model for the cosmology with RAS 18 with 11 million parameters. It's already pre-trained by uh, our collaborate cosmology collaborators. And we're gonna play the same game as we did with our CD. If we have a orthogonal wavelet transform, which we want to find, and we can just put it in through the inverse and make it a bigger model and then use whatever the interpretation. And I'm now using our CD because it's not easy to, as easy to do derivatives and I use uh, something uh, like our one penalty for this bigger um, like uh, composition of functions of phi minus one and uh, inverse and also and with the original deep learning. So that's the interpretation loss. And the first part is reconstruction loss. It's really saying that we um, want the reconstruction to be close. So, so for us, the, the phi transform and inverse to be more or less uh, uh, invertible. And the most interesting part probably is the wavelength loss. And H and G are the low pass and high pass filters. Don't ask me why H is the in indication, I mean, the symbol for low pass, not high pass, but that's just what's used in wavelet literature. And we're looking for a mother wavelet or scaling function so that we can force um, the wavelets to uh, really embed a lot of the prediction power in the deep learning. And we're gonna do stochastic, stochastic gradient design. So how are we gonna make up this wavelet loss? Went back to textbooks in wavelets and just collected all the equations. So I think that too much notation, but there are a lot of equations, these um, high low pass filters have to satisfy and it's a uh, Fourier transform also uh, have to try and satisfy. So collect these equations and turn them into L2 penalties. For the wavelets to hold this had to be equal, but we're gonna make them as small as possible. We collected redundant ones because we really want to enforce. They're not like independent uh, like um, constraints. We just collected more than um, the su sufficient and, uh, and put them into a big loss function. So this is just very typically taken from wavelets books. Look at the equation they have to satisfy. We turn them into constraints or loss functions and make them small, okay? And that's what we end up with. And the trim, the interpretation loss is simply the um, derivative, partial derivative with this um, bigger um, function now included the part we're looking for uh, as the inverse of orthogonal wavelet transform. So let's see how it works. So this is a, again, toy example. We, we uh, trained a synthetic data, which is actually, you know, um, 
like a noisy version of a wavelet. And then with a fully connected small network, and we distill the wavelet. And we can compare with the ground truth. And we tried also with different starting points. Oh, here's now, it's just when the truth is um, Koifman two, and also uh, when you have um, different commonly used wavelengths and even some with noise, we try to recover. And this is just same thing, but we plotted as, uh, as uh, like a scatter plot of the recovered adaptive wavelet and the original wavelet we start with. And you can see they line up pretty well, not perfectly. So now back to the um, a cosmology problem. So the, the cosmology team already uh, trained uh, 18, ResNet 18, which performed the best. So you look at the table, ResNet is the second last column. So this is prediction error uh, 1.15 times 10 to the minus two, right? So we don't have to drag the zero around. So it's pretty small. It looks like 1.1, but it's like divided by 100. So it's 1.15. And before we start working on adaptive wavelets, people already use fixed wavelets and with a peak counting method to estimate. So you have a fixed wavelet and then you just move around and then do this peak counting. And then you get this, um, say with four filters, there's a false peak you don't see actually there in the beginning. It's, it's kind of very weak. So you get this, you move around for each, each peak corresponds to uh, each filter. So what with fixed wavelets, uh, the best performing is the Robert's cross, which is particular uh, wavelet design for this problem, 1.2. And DBRC5 is 1.5 and Laplace 1.3 and peak height 1.6. It's just not using, we just count the peak heights. But if we, we use our deep learning ResNet, and then do the distillation through adaptive wavelet distillation or AWD, you really reduce, uh, improve by 15%, even relative rest net. So the question is, do we need really deep learning? Can we just force it, learn the wavelet? So you remove the um, interpretation loss. That's the last column. You actually get worse. You don't get 1.0, you get 1.3. It's worse than ResNet. So you need somehow borrow the knowledge or information in the fitted ResNet to work with wavelets. It makes things smooth and then um, to get the gain of about 15%. And so now we can also have the four filters, basically, um, you know, low, high, high, low, high, low, and low, low, or high, high. It's just four filters, and if you expand, look at the wavelets, it's about a thousand, a couple of thousand, and then rest there is 11 million. So it's a huge reduction of, even you look on the coefficients, you count at the filter level, you only have just four filters, and you have all come from, filters come from the same mother wavelet. So it's very compact. And this is just a peak method we kind of um, took from the literature, because they know the simulated uh, omega value, and they just compare and use this kind of um, weighted these squares to compare to the peak counting. And this is to show you when we vary the two penalties, one is on the sparsity penalty, we call interpretation penalty, lambda, and the other is uh, attribution penalty, gamma. And you can see that uh, there is a trade-off. We uh, find something right in the middle. And the scientific insight that the difference of mass in the region space with large densities and the surroundings contain information about predicting omega m. So it's really large densities and the sense of like this kind of relative contrast really contain information about this where the original mass was located when the big bang happened. You can kind of see that probably there's some dis dissipation. I'm just using my very unscientific uh, common sense to interpret, but it made sense to the cosmologist. Okay, so that's like we developed for that particular problem motivated by Fourier transform and then local Fourier transform, which is favorites. 
And then uh, we want to do external validation of this particular adapter. It's just partic only solving that problem always solves a class of problems. So it happens that we're working with uh, Gaoko, who is um, the executive uh, scientific director of the Berkeley Advanced Bioimaging Center. And we've been working with them to understand this very important cellular process called clustering mediated uh, endocytosis. I didn't know about we, the cells have this process until I got on the project. It's really fascinating. I always thought that, you know, memories has pores and then things go in and out, right? There's some, you know, way of doing that, like iron channels. But I didn't know that there's another way uh, called a CME. That's how the cells get food and other cargoes inside the cell. So, so the horizontal line is the cell memories. And then the cargo already got lined up through these interactions or chemical interactions and got cold. And then you start forming a little pit and then there's Caesar um, proteins, actin, cut it, and then it become a ball now inside the cell and you uncoat it and then you get the food. Okay, so it's really quite amazing. And this is called, it's a biomolecule called a clustering mediated. Clustering has to be there, but not every time this transportation is successful. Often it's aborted. So the molecular biologists want to understand they call molecular partner problem. It's like two molecule, uh, molecules work together to accomplish a process. So we have clustering. You see it's acting, you can trace its um, intensities in this high nanoscale kind of imaging. And the something else, oxalan, the green one, is a small indication that this cargo is completely transported into the cell. So the problem posed to us was, can we use clustering, which is easier to measure, to the harder to measure, but has more information on whether this uh, CME is completed. So it's predicting from the orange signals to the green signal. We tried to use deep learning on original um, video images. It doesn't work. So we had to use a lot of understanding into the um, optical imaging to really trace the uh, intensities of one molecule, the orange one and the green one. So it turned that into a time series. So now become time series of clustering try to predict oxygen. We, in the beginning, just use a lot of human manually tuned feature inter, feature uh, featureization because we have very limited data. Later we got more data and we end up using LSTM to um, and got the best prediction result. Here we're using R square, so it's a proportion variance in R because this is a continuous uh, signal prediction explained by the model. So the bigger the better. So you can see that if you just use wavelengths, get a feature correction and do linear um, uh, modeling, you get 0.2. You do LSTM, you get 0.23. If you use the adaptive wavelength distillation, you get 0.26. So it's about, again, 15% bump. If you don't use the LSTM interpretation laws. Again, you don't really do, you actually do a little worse than LSTM. But still, even just without using LSTM, we took the six largest coefficients at five scales. We got 30 wavelength coefficients. And in LSTM, we had about 1,000 parameters. So again, it's a huge reduction. And the wavelengths, I think, for this you know, chemistry, physics, um, physical science, driven signals um, seems it's a good match. And again, this is a plot showing that there is a bit search going on uh, to find the right parameters. And if you look at it, this is asymmetric kind of mother wavelet. And it really says that you need a big rise for the clustering, the green signal. We kind of figured that out by looking at a lot of signals already. So this is, this came later. We did a lot of 
hand tuning, you know, manual inspection. So we already know that you need to see a big rise uh, followed by a sharp drop that predict that a successful you know, cargo got transferred inside the uh, cell, uh, cell from outside. And this adaptive wavelets really uh, indicate that this is the same signal we're seeing. And that's what's captioning. So this wavelet is going around this time series looking for uh, such events. And then that become the most uh, predictive. So the last part is really this framework. Um, my group, myself and my team have been delamping almost like for the last 10 years. So stability has been very, very important. Um, and it's a generalization of many different things from numerical analysis, control theory. In some sense, it's the um, positive way of talking about statistical uncertainty, right? If something's stable, that means you don't have much, much variability. So I started working on stability with a paper 2013 uh, to bring this concept into machine learning and as something very important to go with predictability and computability, which already very much established by that point through the kind of uh, advancements of machine learning. And the paper uh, with my former student, Carl Kumbier, now at UCSF as postdoc, appeared last year. It was really, it took many years in the beginning. Actually, I was writing myself. And it was great to have Carl join me. And it was a very long process to really um, put everything together. And we give a cool name actually um, suggested by a colleague, Tian Zhang uh, from Columbia, said that my, I used to have the name like very, very long and veridical means truthful. It's still very much a word used in Spanish, but not so much in English. It's still a word, but uh, we don't use it as much. So here's like taking a step back, right? So I took trained, deep learning models and interpret them. And personally, I hope everybody feels the same way. You want to know where it came from. And the process of deriving a model before interpretation, I think has to be taken into account at the same time instead of, oh, here's a model that just interpreted. Because that really give you some sense. If the process is very rigorous, I would just have more trust. And also reading the documents about how the model was derived will actually give me some understanding where it can be transferred, where about the data collection process, about what data cleaning was done, and how the problem was formulated. All of that will help us to understand how much to trust beyond this kind of take the model, fit it, and then integrate. It should be really a, a whole, um, I will say, a holistic process. So all deep learning uh, models come from a particular data science life cycle, right? I really want us to think about this as a whole process, not just one step, everybody only care about their bit. And I think any data science life cycle should start from a three ring conceptual process. This is taken from the book I'm writing with Rebecca Barter, my postdoc called Revertical Data Science. And we need to think about what's really the reality you try to measure and when you get data, use domain knowledge, you need to think why your data actually represent the reality, the data process, collection process, the design, all of that should be documented. And the algorithm analysis is a largest mental construct. And it's the data scientist's job to put it together in a factual or a rigorous way. So they all actually connect with each other. And, oh, they're done together in a, through computer program and they must capture, they must kind of connect it. And the future data is also very, very important. You have to always keep in mind when we develop a model, what's going to be the future user of um, the algorithm. We have a lot of open source software up on the internet, which is a good thing, but there's also a downside because you don't know who is going to grab your code and start treating a patient. This workshop is about safety. Right, so that we need to have regulation, at least have labels, right? You cannot just produce a drug and with uh, side effects and without saying it. 
right? There's, so I think the algorithms need to start go through some regulation process and have labels because not every algorithm, that's why I have so many different ones, will work for all situations. So you have to see why it works. Some, just like patients, should stay away from this drug and some applications should stay away using this um, algorithm. And we should probably the best, if I get my uh, say, everybody should really describe both in narratives and code and situation, simulated situation that this method is known to work well, data inspired. And also situations seem like this is really bad, this algorithm is just gonna break. So all of that should be in, otherwise we really cannot do um, safety in AI. And um, this is just putting feature inside um, the beginning of any data science project, I think is really, really helpful. And I've been teaching um, our PhD level applied statistics for the last few years, using this kind of uh, framing without doing any coding. A lot of this is important to know domain knowledge, which experts you should talk to, what data. So all of that, when you think this way, you naturally will think. So trust with the AI, I think can be done at least enhanced through quality control data science lifecycle, right? I see it as a whole process, old statistics or classic system, which is so well with car uh, quality, it's because we think things as a process, but this process I think can be a lot more complex than the factory floor process and a lot more human involvement, a lot uh, qualitative. So how can we share best practice to maximize the promise? and damage control. So what I will advocate next about is about sharing practices, best practices. So this paper with a title called Vertical Data Science. So the goal is try to extract reliable reproducible information from data and with an enriched technical language. We have to, for deep learning, I often feel at loss to describe what's going on. We don't even know the language. We don't understand it's like go back and forth. Which, if we propose some concept, and then later we can tune it to see whether this guy was going on in the feeding, in the surface. That's what I mean by enriched technical language. We, so that we can communicate intuitions between different deep learning researchers, and also evaluate empirical evidence. You can say, oh, this is because this geometric features at this location, it doesn't seem right. That's how we get it. And that's why it would be very unstable for generalization or for transfer learning. This is all have to be set into the context of human decision domain knowledge. So certain this concept after we develop them might have become a meaning, just like wave it now, a lot of physical scientists really think just like Fourier transform, they can interpret it. Can we develop this characteristics of this deep learning surface or fitting process eventually have a scientific meaning or domain knowledge? And this is the process I'm hoping we can get to. In particular, this paper proposes PCS framework, as I alluded to earlier. Predictability taken from machine learning and stats, computability taken you know, probably mostly from machine learning, and stability, which is the big thing about PCS. The other just taking more from machine learning and existing. So you try to expand the consideration of perturbation from statistic, control theory, numerical analysis. It's a very, perturbation analysis is very common sense analysis. If something's changed because you have a different human judgment call, you don't want the final conclusion to change. And it doesn't need a theorem. It's just common sense. If you want to be highbrow, we can go back to Plato who said things about knowledge should be tied down, unlike opinions that can change day by day, something like that. So this PCS framework attempts to unify and streamline, expand our ideas and best practice in both machine learning and statistics and beyond for the entire data science life cycle. So stability, predictability is really about future data and computability always there. When you store the data, you have to deal with storage space, all of that, so it's right there. And we're also now building a packages to make a computability for stability analysis much easier. And stability starts from beginning, from problem formulation, right? If you go back to the, um, process 
of data science lifecycle problem formulation. When you have multidiscipline teams or transdiscipline teams, matrix to a cancer biologist means something different than to a mathematic you know, data scientist, right? So that means it's a biological strategy in cancer theory. Here, it just means a tabular you know, table of data. That's linguistic stability. And then you go to data cleaning. If you ask two team members to clean the data, will they get the same result? We make judgment call. Most probably modern just ignore that. And even the concept of random variable, it actually needs stability. If you only have one data set, you never concern yourself for any other data set in the future or by some other lab, you don't need random variable. The random variable, you have to be able to imagine another realization of a similar situation. So what's similar? That means you have to control certain things and the aspect of you care about, and that's really stability. And then visualization, the color choice, if you use a different color, would you see different patterns? And what, how do you do the plotting? How do you label and not to label the axis? And what's the, you know, the range you plot? All of that can really change things. And those all are human judgment calls. So there's no way getting around it. But uh, we need to make it transparent, as I said. And recognize human judgment calls and record them in all the steps along the way. So we need to document. In like our Markdown or Jupyter Notebook. And to record the data collection process, did you design or you just use public uh, databases? And there are many different public databases. Why did you choose to use this, not the other? If you use another one, would you get a different result? And what are the principles you follow to data cleaning? I'm advocating that we should keep multiple copies of clean data. And we should actually do the split training, validation, and test. If you can't afford it, same person, clean the three batches in just with a few days apart, use the same principle, not the same way because there's in the future, the data probably will be cleaned by somebody else. You want to take that into account too. Bring as much as possible. So the test in whatever you're doing should be a surrogate as good as can be to the future situation. Random split is not always a good idea. You might want to do group split. If you have different hospitals of data, you probably want to set hospital size. You might also want to do time split if the things will happen in the future. So random split give two things, give the test set and training and validation too similar and you will underestimate uh, the problem you're encountering. And document domain knowledge. Say so that I mostly have been working only decision trees, random forest in genomic problems because there's biological knowledge that molecules, biomolecules act in many processes as thresholding behavior. And the EDA, we have so many different supervised learning algorithms. Why did you choose? Because that's what you did your thesis on. If that's the case, you cannot be blamed, but just say it. Oh, now with all the software we have, you can now use different methods, even you are now trained on it because you will eventually get trained by using them. So I really think we, have, we should go multiple methods instead of, oh, that's what I know best. I use it. We all do that, but we have to push the boundary because it might not be the right way to solve your problem. And all of that have to use a predictive screening to compare. And then you can do data perturbation choices. In ID case, it's either random or times here, you might take the residues of predictions and perturb that. All of that should be documented. There are many, many ways. You do all the day, you never finish. So you have to write and make the decision. You do a meta judgment call and stop somewhere and lay out the process. You can compare and use prediction as screening and then do perturbation intervals for the algorithm that pass your screening or do what we call PCS p-values. I don't think it makes sense to do p-value calculation if you don't even know your model fits the data at all. So we need to do some basic reality check and predictions in one way and then we should probably add more constraints to make sure the model is kind of within the vicinity of a generative model before you worry about a p-value. It's very refined calculation. 
So whether the models connect with reality, it's really up to us to establish the link through documentation, quantitative, and quality narratives, like this Golden Gate Bridge. You think they're connected because threw them together, but you actually don't see the bridge. You have to write to make sure there is a bridge. So going back to the first two uh, for the uh, adaptive wave uh, distillation, here some stability analysis. Actually, we do stochastic gradient descent on that three-term loss function. This from three randomizations, initializations, and you can see that they are basically the same. So that you need to check. Otherwise, we might just see something might still be useful, but you want to know whether it's driven by a randomization, a randomized initializations. And we also uh, took random 80% of the data. Here is kind of, we don't know the different uh, images are anything particular. We actually could have done some images from different labs we didn't, that take different labs out and see whether we can cross. We could have done, but we didn't. So this is random uh, um, because we didn't have that label. We should have to go back. And you can see that things more or less stay the same. So that's com like comforting to know that um, if you, because how much data we're given is pretty much a judgment call, right? They could have collected a bit more, collected a little bit less. So we want to make sure that the random seeds, all of that doesn't change our conclusions. And you go back to the cosmology problem. We also did the uh, data perturbation. I think the wave is, I don't have the picture here. It's very similar that again, things didn't change very much. So this is a state analysis following the PCS to really say that they're not a randomness now in the algorithm. Is that going to drive uh, the conclusion? And you cannot do every perturbation you never finish. So that's why you need to put in a documentation, say that's the judgment call made, but you should do some, like at least two versions of clean data. You know, for all this combinatorial explosion of choices, you should just do a randomization for each step if they're equally good to you and do a couple to make sure uh, as a sanity check that it's not dry, driven by um, a particular choice. For some problems, you change the data. And there was a very famous case about um, the austerity um, policy by two economists from Harvard with a paper called Debt in the Time uh, of Growth, or Growth in the Time of Debt, we call it a reverse, that they have country data from different countries. And for some reason, they didn't use three data points from New Zealand. And they reached a the conclusion that if your public debt GDP uh, ratio is about 90%, then you have a growth problem. But when you put the three data points in because they don't have good reason not to use it, you don't have that conclusion. And that was used a lot to justify the austerity um, policies in UK to a certain extent, also pushing for that in US uh, in the last financial crisis 2008. So that's like three data points. And there's some coding error too. So to combine that it can completely reversed uh, conclusion for very important policy. So my group has done many other projects, methodology Van Lomben to adding stability for um, cross-validation selection for the soup and selecting number of components in non metric factorization I also developed the iterative random forest we're still using for cardiology, for Drosophila biology. It's really adding stability to successful machine learning algorithms. So they become interpretable, back to my interpretable uh, machine learning uh, scene. And now we all work with domains. Um, this is also in the domain, the last two bullets on the top block also is in the context of Drosophila biology. And now we also bring into neuroscience, uh, randomized trial for subgroup discovery, precision medicine, drug discovery, and we also stress that the clinical decision was mentioned earlier. And my actually my class now is looking at other data, um, working with um, five very uh, kind physicians from uh, UCSF, do a real um, data problem with experts uh, to uh, check on other decision rules using PCS. As I said, scientific machine learning also needs software development. We have built in the process building something called vertical flow in, um, on top of Scikit-learn. We have a cool Lego with drops of water and make the stability perturbation in the ID case much, much easier. And also try to different 
unsupervised on unsupervised learning methods, much, much easier. So you don't have to program much, so you can just um, do it much more easily. We're also building another software suite called SimChef. So we have data inspired different simulations. I think different algorithms should be tested based on different simulated data, especially when you go to inference. You need to know the generative model, but that should take into account some data and with multiple models, even from the same data. So we're also working on that. And everything should be documented. And we follow this PCS design principles. We're also working on paper on design principles. We want transparency, realistic. It's really about prediction and future, and intuitive and modular and efficient, covering computability and reproducibility is really covered under stability. So to finish, uh, we're now going to try to use AWD <coughs> and also ACD for other scientific collaborations. And to get insight in particular, we're working with people from UCSF, <coughs> try to <coughs> prioritize med, um, patient messages and also for pathology, pathology reports, uh, information extraction. And can we find or articulate a class a situation that it's the deep learning models are well distilled by AWD, right? I don't think it works for everything, but can we really tell the users when it might work for them? And it would be great. We're working on with some climate model with uh, UC Davis and Da Young. And there's something called MJO, it's a weather system in Southeast Asia. Can we really build in the uh, AWD with um, mechanistic models? And we're also working with Hutchinson Cancer Center and the Joint Genome Center at IBL Berkeley to really can we get the PCS framework, ideas, documentation into their protocols so the users for their centers can use it. Again, here's my shameless plug, all this PCS framework uh, and the data science lifecycle is put in a book I'm finishing with my former student, Karen Poso, Rebecca Butter, and we're really pushing to finish end of the year. And we should be able to put a free online version in spring 2022. And it takes another after the review, uh, nine months to have a hard copy. It's for upper division and beginning data science. So we'll cover the whole process and really try to emphasize the connection between symbols and the reality and critical thinking. We don't try to use a minimum mass so it's more accessible to people from different areas and uh, refer to other great books for the more mathematical aspects. It's more about thinking and connection the whole process and cleaning and problem formulation. Thank you. <laughs>